Hello and welcome back to another episode of Armchair Analysts, the only podcast that records in full kit. My name is Rupert Meadows and I've written and broadcasted about all things football on platforms such as TalkSport Radio and Give Me Sports. My co-host Cameron McDonald has spent three years working as an FE licensed intermediary here in the UK. But above all else, we're fans. Yeah, thanks for that, Rupert. The round of 16 has wrapped up and what a treat that round was, with upsets, great goals and what some are calling the best day of football ever. We'll be looking at these matches and why they went the way they did, as well as what we could learn from these games ahead of the quarterfinals. As always, timestamps are in the description, and let's start off with England versus Germany, the game we were the most excited for, and you were probably too drunk to remember. So yeah, I mean, are you are you calling me out, or is this the fans were too drunk? <laughs> it was definitely one of those games that I remembered sort of in patches, and then watched back several times, part through joy and glory, and part because yeah, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. I need to talk about this match. <laughs> I need to remember more than just like, Sterling scored, and my entire pint went all over myself. <laughs> it's like, you, you remembered the glory, but not the, the statistics, <laughs> not the or, build up or, or you know, the, um, the breakdown of the game. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it was... Uh, it was an interesting game. Let's start with it, yeah. I just felt like I was equal parts happy and sad because, for example, so good to have Jack Grealish on the pitch making a massive impact. But I do just part of me worries that Gareth Southey is going to going to turn around and say, well, he's such a great sub. It was another one of those games, wasn't it? It was kind of like the first game against Croatia. And the lineup for that game came out. And I think almost universally every England fan was like, oh. Calvin Phillips and Declan Rice, like Trippier at left back, all these players. And then much as we talked about in that episode, it was actually the players that pretty much everyone sort of derided as selections that ended up being the best. And in this game, I mean, what I would say personally is when I looked at the 11 that came out, my reaction wasn't, oh, this is a terrible lineup. My reaction was, this is the best we could have got from Gareth Southgate. Like this was this was as good as it would have been. As good yeah. as it would have been. Because we talked about, obviously, I would have loved Jaden Sancho to play, Jack Grealish to start, Saka to maybe be a left wing back. And all that stuff. When I looked at the 11, the fact that I saw we'd gone for a 3-4-3, the fact that Saka was still playing, the fact that we'd gone for... And and some of the tactics did work. I thought, you know what? It's not what I would have gone for, but it is the best we could have got out of Gareth Southgate. And ultimately, you have to say, I think there's a little bit of nuance behind it, but it did work. We did win the game. Um, I think the thing that a lot of England fans have with Gareth Southgate, particularly with these defensive lineups, because we started this game with seven defensive players, you know, Three centre-backs, two wing-backs, and two defensive midfielders. And then there was just the front three. And part of that is just sort of, we always look at that and go, well, no surprise we didn't manage to score against, for example, Scotland, because there's no chance creation. But I think that England fans have a real issue with Gareth Southgate's sort of, like, defensive favouritism, because it's kind of why we lost to Croatia in the 2018 World Cup. I think a lot of that criticism comes from the Croatia game. If you remember, we were 1-0 up from the fifth minute from that Kieran Trippier free kick. Yeah. And over the course of that game, I think the the moment got to us a little bit. We started to go, oh, we could be in a World Cup final if we manage this correctly. And we started to take attacking players off and take players off and put more defensive players on. And that left Croatia a chance to get back in the game. It gave Modric more space. And I think a lot of the issue that certainly I and I think a lot of fans have is sort of remembering, right, we, we tried to be too cautious from a winning position. And that's why we lost that game. What's interesting here is that it's almost the reverse because what we've been doing and what we did against Germany was we started off very, very defensive. And although the game was very, very dull, maybe that's the best thing you can ask for a game against Germany. Germany really didn't have a lot of good chances. Aside from that Müller one that was down to an individual mistake, Germany couldn't really get their hands on the ball. And Werner, I guess, had one shot, but it's Timo Werner, you can allow that. But they didn't really get a lot of chances. So maybe this was better because I think everyone I've talked to, and I would agree with this, has sort of said that the first 60 odd minutes of this game were complete dross. But then you brought on Jack Grealish and, and he really injected life into the game and sort of got the pre-assist of the first goal and then the assist of the second goal. So there's a part of me that definitely wants to sort of go, oh God, I hope he doesn't think he's an impact sub now. But there's also a part of me that thinks, if you can really squash the game and make it uninteresting and dull and boring and then bring on the players to win it, who am I to say it's not a good strategy? I mean, I guess if England were going to win a World Cup, it probably wouldn't be with our best 11 on the pitch, <laughs> as we've talked about, and it probably would be with these these substitutions that you could maybe argue afterwards should have been starting or not. But again, you do kind of annoyingly, this is why it's frustrating, have to go back to this idea that it worked, we won. I mean, I kind of feel like I my my instinct when I think back to that game against Croatia in twenty eighteen was that I remember having a period of dominance 
for about half an hour. The first half an hour, I thought we were really on top of that game and we didn't consolidate our position. We didn't score a second. And I remember thinking, if we don't get another one, we're really going to be in trouble in this game. And ironically, it almost feels like it was the other way around in that, not that it was Germany's game to lose, but they had at least one ostensibly better chance than we ever had in the first half. Um, and I kind of thought to myself, if Germany don't score relatively early on, this game is just going to stay wide open and there's going to be a chance that we can win it. And that's what ended up happening. It was one of those games, a lot of the time when you play, like for example, England, Scotland, the longer it stays nil-nil, the more nervous you get. Whereas the longer that Germany, England stayed nil-nil, the more you were sort of like, we could get a result here. Because you were like, oh, okay, they haven't really turned on. They haven't been as good as we, we feared they might be. For sure. Well, I, think, I think you've got to give us credit for that. I mean, we, as you, as you yeah. say, yeah, we were defensive, but we did pretty well. To have just two people in that midfield, but to, to stifle all creativity because so much of Germany's creative play comes from the wingers, which is where we had bodies. I mean, I'm glad, as you said, that Southgate chose to play three slash five at the back because... Mm. I really do think, yeah, that that was that was the game changing decision. It feels like an easy one, an obvious one, because we could both kind of talked about it beforehand. But mm. just kind of thank God he made it, right? Well, I think so. I think this is the thing: is most people were looking at how Germany had played so far and had gone a back three or a back five is what we need to win. But there was still that question mark: is like, is he going to play it safe? Is he going to play what he knows? And I think you have to, you know, we've criticised him a fair bit. You have to applaud Gareth Southgate on being willing to sort of change that system in order to suit this team. And it'll be interesting to see. I would imagine against Ukraine. Firstly, I, I would imagine we're going to have a fair few changes because Ukraine have a lot of injuries. But also, they will probably revert to a back four. And I think that ability to be able to change according to the man to, to the, the opposition is a sign of a better manager than I think a lot of people give Gareth Southgate credit for. My, for me, the jury's still out. I haven't really, I'm not sort of flying the flag of, oh, he's amazing. But this is maybe the biggest win he's had as a manager for England. You know, a lot of the criticism of England's run in the 2018 World Cup was, right, they beat all these easy teams or easier teams like your Colombias and your Swedes and the group stage is relatively easy. And as soon as they met a big team in Croatia at the time anyway, they fell over. Here, we've gone through the groups, we've played Croatia again and we've won. And yes, they're a little bit weaker than they were at the time, but we've beaten them. We've beaten Czech Republic, who are one of the dark horses forming of this tournament. And we've now beaten Germany, who some people might go, oh, well, you know, they're in transition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But nevertheless, they are still a very big team before this game happened. Before the two, I think anyone who's saying now that like, all oh, Germany aren't that good is sort of rewriting history retroactively. We came into this game and everyone looked at the tournament starting, the call of the group of death, because Germany are a top, top side and they've been beaten 2-0. to nil. Yeah, very true. And um, yeah, that group of death has died. Um, no, no teams remain from the four that started the strongest group there was. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of yo-yoing between this idea that I can get excited about Southgate because he did the bare minimum of what was necessary tactically. I, I do kind of wonder if, you know, is is this a mark of Germany not being the side that we expected them to be? Literally being so one-dimensional that to just pick a formation is to beat them or to run them close to the line like Hungary did. Um, versus, is it are we so good that we can choose a weakened side or a side that isn't our best 11 against any opposition and still win comfortably? Maybe. It's, it's one of those things. It's, it's what I imagine being like a fan of a Mourinho team is like. Like, you might not like the football when it happens, but you like the result. And I spent the majority of this game being really annoyed at the game. Like, I was looking, screaming at the fucking, you know, screen, just being like, no one's progressing the ball. Especially after Rice got a yellow card, I was like, we need to get Mount on. We need someone who can progress the ball through the midfield. Every time we got the ball in the middle, it was sort of just going side to side. And maybe because I think you're a fan of the team, you want the ball to be going forward, obviously, ideally, to become sort of an assist or a pre-assist. But... If the ball going side to side is an alternative to losing the ball and Cruz taking it and that sort of going out to Robin Gosens and that starting a really dangerous move, then it is better. And I think as much as I love Jack Grealish, as much as I love Jaden Sancho, and I think these players should be starting, if we're looking back at this tournament and Jaden Sancho hasn't set foot on the pitch, but England have won the Euros, I'd go, hands up. He made the right decision objectively because England have won it. 
maybe you could say, and I sort of still feel this way a little bit about Raheem Sterling, we could have won it more easily, but by hook or by crook, we would have won it. I guess I I do feel like that's maybe a bit of a, a logical fallacy in that just because he didn't start, we don't know that he wouldn't have played better and it would have been an easier result. We wouldn't have been more likely to win with him there. But I, I do get what you mean. I think um I just worry that this post-match analysis, which has been so overwhelmingly positive, is maybe losing sight of the fact that we didn't play that well for more than two thirds of the game. Sixty-eight minutes or so until Grealish. Yeah, came exactly. Out. I mean, I remember um, watching Rio Ferdinand talk about the players afterwards, and it felt like he literally could have said, "Like, and how amazing was Jordan Pickford to receive the ball from ten yards from Kyle Walker, and then to pass it another ten yards to Harry Maguire? Unbelievable player! What a stunning player! I'm so glad mm. that we decided to keep him in that lineup." And the way that he talked about Sterling was that, like he made everything happen the whole night, and I was just kind of asking. He scored the goal, but did we watch the same game? Oh, Harry Kane was shocking. But the the hope now, and this is me sort of keeping myself ignorant. But, but, he's, but he's on all of the newspapers. Uh, but, and the but, narrative but, is... But of course that, he is. Well, of course he is. But I feel like England has... They get so in, into themselves that we lose sight of things. And the, I don't... The, I just the, worry that the players are going to do that. And the manager's going to do that. The hope is there, though. It's like Harry Kane's been shocking this tournament. Absolutely shocking. And even the goal that he did score even the goal that he did score, rather, it was kind of like a lot of the goals Raheem Sterling has scored. It wasn't him. It was all Jack Grealish. It was, it was you know, a, a decent finish, but he he basically had the goal made for him. What you would hope now is that that will build confidence for him and we can see Harry Kane. Because I was thinking about England after this game and I was thinking, right, England have beat Germany 2-0. And for big parts of this tournament, we've essentially been playing with 10 men with Harry Kane on the pitch. He's just wandering around the defensive midfield doing nothing at all. But there is a world-class player there. That guy is top three, maybe top two strikers in the world on his day. If he can find that form going into the quarters, the semis, the finals. If this is England already, having not conceded the goal yet and having that part locked down, and we can then add Harry Kane like he looks at Spurs, then there's no reason we couldn't win in the final or or in the semis of the course against any team in the tournament. It's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously international football is is just a strange one in the... These players don't get that off that much time to train as a team, so it almost feels like someone like Germany can have this incredible, incredibly weaponous starting eleven on paper, but they just look like such bit part versions of themselves on the pitch. And yeah, I, I think that ultimately England can probably give anyone a good game on the day. So there's no reason why we can't progress pretty far. Dare I say it? Take, take football home. Wow. Um, well, we've talked about England. Let, let's talk just for a little bit about Germany here because England playing good was just half of the story. It's kind of like when we played against Scotland and as much props as you had to give Scotland because they played very well, <laughs> England also just did a favour by yeah, not yeah, yeah. playing well at all. And I think England played very, very well here. The defence was great, but Germany were not the side that we were expecting they were going to be. I think a big part of that is because Timo Werner started. I know we've talked about how like people always try and move the goalposts about how good a season's been for Chelsea. This was a classic example of what he is supposed to do and what he has somehow forgot how to do. Um, Score goals. Well, exactly. And I think it was you know, very good sportsmanship from Germany to sort of look at Harry Kane's form this tournament and go, right, you're starting without a striker. We will also start without a striker. 10 men versus 10 men. But... You know, the Germany effect in general, the wingbacks that have been so devastating, just didn't look quite the same. And I do think that was part due to tactics. I thought that Kieran Trippier and Bakayo Saka doubling up on the right side did really well to neutralise who is, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous players at this tournament so far in Robin Gosens. Yeah, definitely. And Kimmich was having to tuck in a lot as well because he couldn't find a lot of space down the flanks. And he did look dangerous in those areas, but again, was sort of neutralised by those midfields coming in. I thought that they just didn't quite get things going. Thomas Muller, who normally is like one of the most reliable players you can think of. He's not like a very extravagant player. Like he likes a laugh, but he's normally just like gets his head down and gets the job done. Missing that chance. I mean, at 1-0 down, you may be having to sort of like thank the lucky stars that that, that, that one happened. Because that I think he takes that shot 10 times. He scores it 9 times. See, I, I weirdly am not sure if I agree with that. Because when I think of Thomas Muller... I don't think of a number nine that is hanging on the back of the the defender and making a break through a high line and then being one-on-one with the keeper and taking a shot from outside the box 
to like bend around him. That's not who Thomas Muller is. He's someone who is able to find little pockets of space in a in like a, a deep line. He's someone that's able to ghost into the box at different in different areas. And I actually don't think the strength of Thomas Muller is in that kind of finishing opportunity. I, I don't not, think not, that not suited I. him at all. I, he he's not the kind of person who normally launches a counter attack. But if like, I was how to many describe... goals can you think of Thomas Muller having scored like that? Oh, they're almost always from like five yards out. But I think he's such a composed player, and that was. The kind of goal yeah, that even true. if like a left back had been running through on goal, you'd expect them to at least get it on target. Yeah, and, me- for, and for Thomas Muller to put it wide, I was—I mean, I was out there. I was like, "Thank God!" Oh, I mean, I remember I thinking was, the same thing shocked. at the time. I was so happy, so relieved that he'd done that. But I, I do think, on reflection, that's just not his game. I, I agree. It's not something he does all the time. He's much more sort of like operates on the second ball. But I, I was just surprised that of all players, he kind of fluffed his line. But if, if that I been agree t- with you. Mean, if that had been Timo Werner, if yeah. Timo Werner put it wide, I think everyone would have gone classic. Yeah, but with with Thomas but, Muller, because he doesn't normally get into those scenarios, but he is normally a player that you can rely on and a clinical very player. Very composed. Yeah. yeah, there was that idea of like, oh. So my my sort of last question to you as we wrap this up, game, based on the fact that England have won this, was Southgate's team selection vindicated? Or did the subs that happened show that Grealish should have started? If you're Gareth Southgate for a day, ahead of Saturday's game against the Ukraine, are you starting Jack Grealish? Or are you sticking to the format that Gareth Southgate has gone for, given that it beat Germany? Well, I mean, I guess this whole idea of, like, if we're Southgate for the day, we've already played this game in our England preview, and we already both, I think, dropped Sterling... For someone else, and I'm, 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 so the the situation I have in mind here is like a little dicky. You've swapped brains with. You're in Chris Brown's body for a day, so you still have your brain. Okay, he's woken up as you. In, not in, not in, going for the Ronaldo. <laughs> no, okay, cool. No, he he's woken up. He's very confused. You've woken up in his body, and you're yeah. you're a man with a purpose. Are you doing like just letting it ride? Are you making big wholesale changes, or are you are you leaving it sort of more the same? Neither. I'm not going to make wholesale changes because you've got to ride what little momentum you have. I don't think... I mean, obviously, this game will bring momentum, but it wasn't a momentous performance. And we did look so toothless for what we've already agreed is is more than two-thirds of the game. Vossed so, out, yeah. yeah, I'm definitely making changes. Firmly, firmly, yes. Is Kane getting um, dropped? I... The reason why I wouldn't mind dropping Kane, and it was kind of part of the logic that I, I used when... I said that I would almost prefer to have DCL up front mm-hmm. against Germany, is that if you drop him, then you tell him that if he doesn't do what you want him to do, he doesn't play. He doesn't have that sense at the moment. He's not been playing well at all. He starts every game like he's the Messiah. And I would be absolutely fine with just giving you a little nudge and going, we actually have other strikers who are good and will do what we want them to do in the game. So why would we start you? So you can take corners, like there's no point having him there if he's not going to play a striker's role. So it, it does. Feel I, like... I would be happy just in the sense that I, I don't want to be rude to Ukraine, but this feels like it's obviously an easier game than Germany. And they've got and lots of injuries. They've got lots of injuries, and I would be happy with trialing one or two new things, not mm. wholesale changes. I think that would be bad, but I think yes, I would be happy to to make one or two things like bench Sterling, bench Kane. And just bring in a couple of other players because it keeps things rotating. It keeps things fresh. And I don't think they've done enough. They just haven't. It is kind of funny whenever I think of Harry Kane for England. Because he, like, he had the 2018 World Cup where he like filled his boots against some lesser size and got, and got some penalties. But like other, but he did get the golden boot. But other than that, like his England career is going to be so far anywhere, like noted by the bizarre misuse of him by managers. Like we look back at like under Roy Hodgson, he was taking corners. Now we look at him under Southgate and he's like a defensive midfielder. What on earth is he going to look like under the next manager? He's going to be in goal. And, and and also, do you think that this, this is my sort of little, little head cannon, but question to other people. Do you think when Daniel Levy is watching the England matches, as he almost certainly is every time, he's like rubbing his hands together and chuckling when Harry Kane drops another goose egg? And oh, he's like, just so he's, he's like, not ha, leaving ha, ha, this year. Ha, 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 Man City have suddenly withdrawn the offer. <laughs> maybe. I mean, maybe this is Harry Kane's turnaround for Spurs, um, not willing to accept the uh, the approaches from rival clubs. I, I just, I don't get Harry Kane's England performances either. And I don't think you can just blame 
manager's mismanagement because surely there's something else going on there. It, it seems so black and white what you would do with him as a player and, and what doesn't happen. Well, we already have two defensive midfielders. We've got Rice and <laughs> and Phillips. We only Harry Kane as a defensive mid as well. Do you know what? What I will say is that like, if Gareth Southgate doesn't want him dropping deep to create, then don't have a flat two of Calvin Phillips and, and Declan Rice. Like, put Mason Mount in there. Put Jordan Anderson in there. Put Jude Bellingham in there. Literally do any other midfield pairing. Play Rhys James in midfield. I, I don't care. Anyone's going to get forwards more. If, if you don't want him feeling like he has to come back to, to do things and spark plays, then don't give him the opportunity. Like Dominic Cavalu and his nate. <laughs> no, but no, he's, he's not exactly a distributor. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, if, if Harry Kane's going to come back in the oh, field anyway. He DCL can... <laughs> swaps. I mean, to be fair, I would happily have someone like DCL as a second striker. Yeah. Like, so... I, I genuinely think that that is a legitimate tactic. For England to, to use moving forwards, but yeah, no, I, I think it's very like there's a lot to like about what's happened so far. There's a lot to work on, but I think that's kind of a good position that we have got this team that's made it through to quarterfinals, but it doesn't feel like we've exhausted all of our options yet. Grealish hasn't hit his full potential yet. I still think there's more to be made out of Saka. Sancho hasn't even hit the pitch yet, so there's so much to love. But before we get sure. too into England, shall we move into? Our next game, which is maybe the upset of the tournament, the upset that I've been waiting for since the group stages. I've wanted a big one. I was looking for it with Germany, Hungary. I was looking for it with France, like sort of France, Portugal, sort of loads of games. I've sort of been sitting and waiting for a big upset, and finally it took to the knockout rounds, but I got it. And that was, of course, France versus Switzerland, three uh, three over the course of 120 minutes, and then in penalties, Switzerland won five four. Do you reckon that that was that was one of the best games we've seen in the tournament? I think it has to be. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, the fact that just so many goals were scored and it, it was an unbelievable match. It's such, such a crazy day of football as well. To have, but the the um, two games, Croatia, Spain yeah. and France, Switzerland, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people said, yeah, best day of football ever. And I was really thinking about it. And, you know, we're not as old as some football fans around there, but like... It's hard think to of think of one else. in living memory, or at least one that I've heard of, that, that kind of eclipses that. 14 goals across two games is wild. Absolutely, yeah. And and it, I would say the game started out exactly as, as Switzerland would have wanted. They got an early goal. They were able to you know, adapt their strategy to try and sit back a little. France then went on the offensive, managed to nab three goals, and then took their foot off the pedal. Do you think that they lost sight of, of the game management overall? Or do you think that they were unlucky to concede? Do you think they... Yeah, what's your take? Well, it was a funny one because France conceded early to Harris Seferovic, by the way, who played like absolute butt cheeks for the first two group games and then somehow found form. Like every Swiss person I know was looking at the first two Swiss group games and was like, Jesus Christ, this guy is... is it's not even like playing with 10 men. It's like playing with someone playing as 12 v 10 because he was just missing chances and missing chances. Yeah, yeah. Against Wales, like a big part of the reason that Switzerland didn't get a result was because Harris Seferovic was just not getting it together. And you can't really blame them against Italy, I suppose. But, you know, he, he didn't look great there either. And then against Turkey, he sort of found a bit more form. And in this game, he looked great. He got two goals and, and two really nice goals as well. Um, but it was, it was one of those things where he scored very early. And it was like, I was looking at that. And part of me was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, could Switzerland get away with like a result here? And there was also a part of me, like we talked about this before with like Man City and like Real Madrid and Barcelona, like big teams, where it's like scoring early is the football equivalent of like kicking a wasp's nest. And then just turning around and bending over. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, is this about to be an absolute like 7-1 mauling? Because France are just like, you dare. But then if anything but, like Switzerland then got a penalty. And it, the penalty that I was like, Ricardo Rodriguez, Ricardo Rodriguez, I remember him as being a little bit of a penalty specialist at Wolfsburg and like all this stuff. He then took a horrible penalty. I later learned that this is a hat trick of missed penalties for him. He's missed his last three, including that one. Um, and it was just not a good penalty at all. It wasn't no, even a great no, save. No, it was not. And it was at that point that I was kind of like, well, Switzerland, you've kind of bungled this. There was a moment where you just thought, yeah, like, surely you can't lose, miss a penalty and still beat France. I was like, there was a chance for this to be a massive upset and then you've squandered it there. And, and that sort of only deepened as France sort of went away with that game more and more and more um, and played really well. And Paul Pogba had just... I, I feel like Paul Pogba, 
as someone who is not a United fan and thus not predisposed to hate him for no reason whatsoever, I just always feel really bad for him because he plays really good football. Pope is great, yeah. But, but, but this is the thing, it's like he plays really well for France and then United fans are like, fucking hell Pogba, why can't you play like that for us? And it's like, have you ever stopped to think that with the catalogue of players that have played terribly for Manchester United over the last 10 years, it might not played be his very fault. well <laughs> elsewhere, both for club and country, it might not be Pogba's fault that he plays badly at Man United. No, no. Just a little food for thought there. Blinking, blinking, blinking. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, he, he for me, was sort of in, in with a shout for best player of the tournament up to this point. He's controlled so many games. Fantastic. I mean, playing alongside Kante, um, I think this is the first time France have ever lost with those two playing together. I could, could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, and they've just been a delight to watch together because it's, it's really that sort of give and take midfield duo. Um, and he scored just a fantastic goal. The only kind of funny thing about that was that he did like four celebrations. Like he did one and then went straight yeah, to the next yeah, one, yeah, then yeah, straight yeah. to the next one. And I, at that point, I was like, it's 3 1, Paul. But if Spain, sorry, if, if France don't go on to win this, you're going to look like an idiot. Egg, egg all over your face, yeah. Egg all over your face. Um, but yeah, great goal. Not even France's best goal. People were talking about that as the goal tournament. Benzema's goal. The touch, that touch goal. Yeah. Holy guack. That was unbelievable. Getting it from behind him and sort of just like kicking it into the oh, Special, that, special. That special. was like it's one of those Harrogs and Carnu, like it's just a moment in an international tournament that you just think like that was unreal. It was one of those goals that you're watching a game as a neutral and it makes you make a sound involuntarily. Yeah, like you sort of go <gasps> like a like, Tim Cahill volley or a Ron Van Persie diving header or just these special moments. Um absolutely one of those. I guess the weird thing that I've thought about France this tournament is that I don't really understand why they have been trying to play anything other than incredibly aggressive, expansive attacking football. Like why play through the group stages doing counter attacking? Your midfield is N'Golo Kante, sure, and then Paul Pogba and Antoine Griezmann. Up front you've got Karim Benzema and Kylian Mbappe. You've got Adrian Rabio at wing back. Like this not it's not a defensive side by design. And it just felt really strange that when given the Lions share of possession, France just didn't really look like they knew what to do with it at all times. They they played well when they were I guess like under under pressure when they needed to score a goal, but again they scored a few and then settled back into what in, must have been the the strategy. Yeah, sat back and let it get away from them. And I thought that even seeing the lineup when they started with wing backs against Switzerland, I was sort of like, why have you, what, what reasoning is there to do that? It was a very bizarre choice for me. It seemed like overly defensive and no disrespect Switzerland, they've beaten France. But I mean this not just for Switzerland. I mean this for every team in the tournament. I think France should have walked this tournament. I don't think there's anyone that has as good an 11 or indeed squad as France. It's not even close, in my opinion. No, you're right. And yet they've gone out in the round of 16 to, and again, no disrespect Switzerland, ostensibly one of the weaker sides in the knockouts. Sure. So I, I, I just didn't understand why they came this way. They let the game get away from them. And it, it just seemed like a real mismanagement for, uh, of the game. Um, looking at Switzerland, though, I mean, we talked about Harris Seferovic coming, coming really good. Let's talk about the man of the match from this game, because this is a player that whenever we talk about the Premier League, he is someone who has real ups, real downs. He pulls out a world-class game, maybe 1 in 15, and then immediately follows it up with a game where he gets sent off for three games, or he, he has a shocker and gives away a penalty. Granite Xhaka. Arsenal are thinking about selling him this summer. How good is he? Is he elite? Define elite. Is Granit is he Xhaka world class? Could, is he could Granit is he Xhaka quality? theoretically like uh, like I think about this a lot with, like with a lot of like Arsenal players or not just Arsenal but a lot of players that play at clubs that are like like we were just talking about United with Paul Pogba sure like players that look less good than they possibly could at other clubs like could Granit Xhaka go and play for like Juventus or Real Madrid and and be good or is or is this just sort of the the symptom of Granit Xhaka as he does in the Premier League where he comes out and he looks really really good. And then you go, oh, wow, this guy's really good. Like, there's so many players. Like, Musa Sissoko is my classic one. of sort of just, like, one in 15 games that's great. And then the other 14. Sure, sure, like, oh, sure. God. Well, okay, so I guess two two points to that. The first point, no. <laughs> <laughs> let's have oh, a let, no, point no. more of an answer, but <laughs> sure. The second thing I would say is you've given Pogba a lot of leniency over the side that he plays with at club level. 
Rene Xhaka plays for Arsenal. Yeah, no. He's not necessarily Ar- surrounded by world-class players week in, week out. I think there are different reasons. Though. I think Arsenal, obviously, at the moment, is, is a miles worse team than Man United. But Man United, for some reason, post-Ferguson, seems to have the most toxic club culture in world football. So many players who are just top-tier go there, look garbage, and then look top-tier again the second they leave. No, true. Uh, I, I guess you can't really make as as much of a judgment on Arsenal. But again, Arsenal don't have the same sort of revolving door of world-class talent. So True. You know, it's not like someone like Memphis Depay has left Arsenal in recent memory and, and be, been incredible because mm. really the only one that I can think of is Alexis Sanchez, but he was, what, like 32 when he left? It wasn't even that good after he left either, really. And he wasn't that good when he left, but... But, but pretty... no, no, I, I take your point. But I, the point, this is the point I'm making because Granit Xhaka is sort of slightly unique in this. Because I'm trying to think of a lot of other players. The good players for Arsenal look good for the most part, otherwise, and the bad players for Arsenal look bad otherwise. Whereas Granit Xhaka is sort of looked <laughs> poor at, at big times for Arsenal, and then good for the odd game, and then looks really good this tournament for the most part. I guess the main thing is, you know, do you think this is just he just doesn't have an elite mentality? Like, does he just not have the wherewithal? mentally to be able to focus for 90 minutes unless it's for his country which he loves and wants to do well for i mean it's very possible we talked about yarmolenko the other day and how he has this like absolutely bonkers record for ukraine and then it's sure. just poultry for all the clubs that he played for it's just like middling and and i would say yarmolenko is a great example because yarmolenko also like granite Xhaka, shows moments of real quality mm. Yeah, it almost feels like sometimes when he feels like it, he can turn it on. I think Granit Xhaka has a great up upside. I think like his potential is vast. Will he ever realize it? I think potentially no, unless he has a change of heart when he goes to a bigger club like Juventus or Real Madrid, and realizes that he's in some some sort of elite position and and therefore is able to focus himself. I I just don't think that he has the mindset to play it at top level in the way that you suggest. So that I guess that would be my, my overall answer. I think that's a fair analysis. Last for this game, uh, obviously it was 5-4 to Switzerland. Switzerland scored all of their penalties. France scored their first four and their final penalty was taken and missed by Kylian Mbappe. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism flying around at Kylian Mbappe. Um, a lot of people have sort of said like, well, he took the fifth penalty, he tried to do the Ronaldo thing, and he sort of, it's, it's a little bit arrogant to do that. If you're confident scoring a penalty, you should try and score early on, and he's only got himself to blame. I feel quite sorry for him. It was a very bad penalty, and it was not the kind of penalty we expect from a player of his quality. But I, just, I, I mean, partly because I like Mbappe, but I just felt bad for him, because he's like a young guy, you're entitled to the mistake. It also just felt like, you know, whenever someone like Ronaldo or Messi have had, like, international shortcomings. The blame always gets levied as like at, like, the rest of the team around them, whereas Mbappe doesn't really have that luxury because he plays for quite a good France side. And so where he gets the criticism, where those guys don't, is that it seems to all be going at him. And I just hope that it's not one of those things that sort of hampers his development. I think... I don't think it will hamper his development. I think he's already established enough that it's not going to phase him too much, like, barring a, a self-confessed bad couple of nights' sleep. I think that, I guess the main difference is we didn't have much skin in the game because we're not France fans. So it's easy for us to say like, well, I like the technical quality of Mbappe when I watch him play. He seems like a decent guy and and I enjoy watching him. So I like him and I don't really care that France lost. So I'm not going to take it too personally for him. Versus a France fan going, all our hopes were on that penalty and you maybe should have taken it, should have handled that situation differently. So in, in the same way as someone like, I don't know, Jaden Sancho. If Jaden Sancho had, say Jaden Sancho comes on against Ukraine, takes the fifth penalty, and then just, you know, maybe tries something special like a Penenka or tries to really sell the keeper with his eyes and puts it wide or for whatever reason... D- tries to do something a little too ostentatious, doesn't quite make it, and then Germany fans are like, "Well, I still just like him as a player." You'd be obviously normal. That's yeah, fair. That makes sense. 
I mean, my, my take is I, I'd really like killing Mbappe. So anytime he does something bad, I'm just blaming it on Brazilian San Maximan. Yeah, and, and Germany <laughs> wants to give Jaden Sancho a passport. <laughs> so, you know, I, yeah, I think um, Mbappe will be fine. He's already an elite superstar. Um, I, I think that his reaction is right. He should be heartbroken. And, well, heartbroken. He should be, he should take it hard. And yeah, he'll bounce back for sure. Looking at the, maybe the second biggest upset of the groups, Netherlands losing to Czech Republic 2-0. Um, and a few big stories about this. I mean, one of the first things that I wanted to comment on, and it's weird to talk about this for the losing team, Denzel Dumfries is, if he's not playing at a top side at the end of this summer, everyone has missed a trick. I was watching this game, and despite the fact the Netherlands lost it, he was covering so much ground, it looked like he was teleporting around the pitch. It was utterly insane. On a number of occasions, he was like coming down the left flank and I was like, you're way out of position. <laughs> and then sure enough, Czech Republic would regain the ball on the tank and he would just be back at right back. And I'd be like, but, ha- but, what, but what? how many of you are there? <laughs> well, exactly. It, it was really insane. I, I think he's one of those, one of the true winners of the Euros that I think has sort of played so well, despite the fact that this team got knocked out, that he's secured himself a big move. The other one, of course, being Patrick Schick, who is continuing his run towards the golden boot. Uh, obviously, the other contenders... Uh, aside from Romelu Lukaku, have now been knocked out. So he's still sort of, you know, looking to get it. It's uh, between uh, Ronaldo and Own Goal at the moment on five. Uh, I don't think Own Goal might even be top. I, I need to check that, but I might be wrong. Own Goal's definitely top. There have been like ten Own Goals in the <laughs> so far. I think there have been six actual Own Goals that haven't been like... Red- oh, retroactively changed. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but even so, I think they might be. Um, but looking at this game, <laughs> if Frank de Boer the worst of all time football manager. The guy has a shocking record. And obviously for any, um, you know, Premier League fans, we all remember his time at Crystal Palace. Um, he was sacked 10 weeks after taking the, the role after Palace lost their first four league matches of the season without scoring a single goal. They were the first team in 93 years to begun to have begun a top flight season in such a fashion. Um, and just before that, he has st- signed a contract with Inter Milan and was sacked after only uh, 85 days, I believe it was. Um, because he, he lost four games in five, left Inter in 12th place, lost to teams like Hapoel, Beersheba and Sparta Prague in the Europa League, um, and just had an absolutely shocking run. And now he's taken this Netherlands team. For a minute, we all thought, oh, they're great. I mean, Wijnaldum's a top player. Memphis Depay is looking really hot. Dumfries is good. De Ligt's a top player. And they've just crashed out so badly here to a Czech Republic side that are looking very promising, but probably were not expected to do this well and not really have any trouble against the Netherlands. Yeah, I mean, he's surely an, a great example of a player, an ex-player that was a great player in his day, but should not have been given the opportunity to, to transition to manager that easily and should not have been given as many top flight coaching positions as he's been given. I guess the, the one maybe would be for Atlanta. I think he had quite a shocking start for them as well. I think it quite like he he did he sort of leveled it out. But I think it had quite a shocking start. I think I think he may have even broken a record for them with like some sort of like the first coach to concede a hundred goals with his trousers around his ankles or some something like that. <laughs> I could be wrong, but, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's true. But I think it's a symptom of like he's Dutch, so he got the Ajax role basically on a technicality and did I mean, well because Ajax dominated that league most of the time. I mean, he was at Ajax for like that whole 90s, yeah. And, 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 then, and then springboarded that into getting a job at Inter, where he did terribly, and then sort of downgraded from Inter to Crystal Palace and did terribly, and then went to Atlanta and didn't do amazingly, and then somehow got the Netherlands job. I bet, presumably on the technicality as well. I mean, he he did, um, he was an assistant at the Netherlands from 2008 to 2010, so I guess he just knew the the setup personnel, and there was no one better that would take the role. He so knows how to put the cones out, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, a, a role I'd be happy with as well. It it's a weird one for sure. The other loser of this game, I thought, was Mustelect. Um, I thought that his red card was really bizarre. It was one of those where I was just like, if you make that foul at 85 minutes, everyone calls you a hero because you've sacrificed yourself for the good of the team. You make that foul at nil-nil, 55 minutes in. Why have you thrown the game away for your team? Because it, it was 
fairly even. Maybe even Netherlands looking a little bit more hot there. And then Czech Republic just ran away with the man advan- uh, advantage. And, and credit to them because that's not always easy to do. Sometimes, you know, when you have a man advantage, the other team really sits behind the ball and makes it tough. But Czech Republic really replied um, and did really well. Thomas Hollis was great as well, although I, I have a little bit of a hatred for him. Not based on anything he does or, 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 or you know, on the pitch or as a person. But the fact that he's a defensive midfielder that wears the number nine shirt, which is deeply... It doesn't sit well, does it? It doesn't sit well. But, you know, goal and assist, better than any game that Harry Kane's had. So, yeah, who, who well, are we to argue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have a defensive midfielder who wears a number is nine. Thomas we have Hullis, a number nine who plays like Thomas a defensive a, a better number nine than Harry Kane you know in how this we were, tournament? You know how we were talking earlier about, like, if you switch bodies with Gareth, Gareth Southgate for a day? <laughs> Wait a <laughs> second. <laughs> they met in, like, a changing room in the group stages. <laughs> Bump, <laughs> bumped into each other in the tunnel and... Uh, but yeah, no, that, that that was a great game. And Czech Republic, yeah, definitely a team that I'm I'm interested to see how they do. They're playing Denmark next. Um, obviously, we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the previews episodes. But um, definitely a team that are, that are very exciting to, to continue to look at. Yeah, definitely. The um, next game we've got is the second highest scoring game in Euros history. Croatia 3, Spain 5. And before I want to talk about this game, <laughs> do, do you know what the highest scoring game in Euros history is? It was something like the first ever game... It was Yugoslavia 5, France 4, the first ever game of the European Championships in 1960, which is so funny to me because it's just like, imagine pitching a new tournament and people are sort of watching it, they're like a little bit unsure, they're like, oh, I don't really know about all this, and the first game has nine goals, never to be beaten. You'd be like, Jesus Christ, every four years, put on every other year. I have to watch this. <laughs> yeah, I've got a confession to make. You actually told me that while drunk <laughs> after the England-Germany game. That makes so sense. So I, I had no idea at the time. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you might have thought I had good knowledge there. I did not. Um, moving into this game, though, and about the sort of legacy of being the second highest scoring match, I thought it was so funny reading about the Croatian FA and sort of their response to this. The Croatian FA, for those who don't know, have like this, I can't decide whether it's pitiful or like hilarious response to every time they lose big things. For a long time after the 2018 World Cup final defeat, the Croatian FA took to calling the Croatian national team the World Vice Champions, which is such a hilarious <laughs> bit of like shithouse banter because most teams would get absolutely shellacked for it. I feel like just most people didn't know about it and so Croatia have kind of gone away with it, but they had like banners and murals saying like, Vice Champions 2018. It's like the kind of joke you make at the pub yes. with your mates and get laughed at for it. You remember how much like Mourinho got um, memed for saying like his biggest achievement was finishing second with Man United? Like, imagine England, like, losing in the final and being like, we're vice champions. You would get ruined for years and years and years. Um, but I just think it's so funny that Croatia that. And then they followed up this game by, like, the FA, t- the Croatian FA tweeted, like, ah, the second highest scoring match in Euros history. We, we did it fantastically. I thought it was great again. Um, it was a great game. I thought, they really take the wins where they can get them done. They really do. <laughs> I thought it was a great game. I was glad it ended 5-3 instead of being uh, a 1-0 after Unai Simon's own goal, which was, uh, also Pedri's own goal that was an Unai Simon mistake. Um, there was an absolute shocker and it was just, I was glad that it didn't end that way. Not because I had any sort of particular allegiance to either side, but just because you hate from a personal level to see a, get a mistake like that. Sure thing. So it was something that shocking. I like a good own goal, but that was just so, uh, just skin crawlingly bad. It was one of those we always had to like look away. Um, but Spain doing really well here. I mean, I think it was one of those funny things where squad depth hurt and then saved them in equal measure. Like they went three, one up and they started pulling players off. And that's when Croatia got back to the game and you started to go, Oh my God, Enrique, you've absolutely bungled this. But then when it got to the sort of extra time, Croatia were just visibly absolutely exhausted and Spain took the the full advantage of that game. Um, and, and managed to sort of put it away. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember last week or in in the special episode we were talking about this and you kind of questioned whether or not Spain had better squad depth than than Croatia and we kind of talked about it and, and we did say that yeah Spain do just comfortably have players that they can pull out their ears and to able to bring on someone like Pau Torres even someone like Jordi Alba he might be old but that's an unbelievable sign to make it like the 75th minute um and then you know to finish the game out bring on Rodri for Busquets bring on someone like Oyazabal who is a really exciting attacking player, is just something that not a lot of teams can do. I think they used their subs... Well, at the time I thought it was badly, but then retroactively it looked good when they managed to sort of outclass Croatia. But that's the thing, like, it, any win is justified, right? It's very true. It's very true. I, I slightly want to go into Pedri a little bit, but I think we can also do that probably in the previews for, for Spain's next game. But Pedri, I mean, 
a couple of question marks over him going into the tournament, not because he's not great, but it was the same sort of thing as we in England had for Saka. It was like, you're great, you're very young, so is it maybe too soon? Yeah. Um, but he is another player that has just been sort of just just absolutely running games. People are calling him the next Iniesta, and it's one of those times where I'm not just like, I mean, Jesus Christ, because like, you wouldn't he be might, shocked if in, if in five years. Yeah. He's 18. 17 when he sold at the tournament. Ludicrous. Ludicrous indeed. Um, Moving into Utah's trivia before we move into the second half of the games, I've got one for you this week, um, and that is something based on uh, one of the teams that has now gone out. Um, did you know, Rupert, that only one player has scored in a French win this tournament? Only one player has scored in a French win this in a, tournament. In a game that France have won. France, the world champions, only one player has scored in a game that they've won. And that player is Germany's Mats Hummels. <laughs> <laughs> so probably something that everyone sort of could have worked out themselves but just a funny telling of it that I quite enjoyed uh, finding out for myself and sort of putting that all together I was desperately trying to remember which player did the it was goal with, with a spectacular end goal uh, and you know what I mean like that kind of spectacular end goal I feel way less sorry for than the Unai C1-1 because I'm like he took it well there fair play <laughs> he absolutely slotted it didn't he absolutely did um, yeah and also because it's Matt Hamels and He's going to be fine with it. He's It'll like, be fine. He's got so much. Like, how old is he? 35? He's got know. such a good career. And yeah. yeah. Well, not to be outdone, I have chosen a piece of useless trivia about an ex-player of a side that remain in the tournament, which Ooh. is Denmark, um, who dominated the game 4-0, which we will talk about a little later on. Um, Harold Boer, B-O-H-R, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Uh, I'm sure I've butchered it. Was Certainly. a um, a kind of early 20th century um, football player who was also a mathematician. And um, as a mathematician, he wrote a doctoral thesis, which um, due to his in- immense popularity as a national Danish football player, meant that um, apparently when he had to defend his thesis, the um, audience was reported as having more football fans than mathematicians, which... In, in the world of, like, as we start to get back into, like, fan mindsets and, like, I don't know, like, the, the stadium mentality, I just love the idea of, of, like, the opposition mathematician getting heckled to shit by by Danish national fans who are just, like, squatting, maybe maybe chanting Boa's name. Um, one can only imagine what kind of I fun just, they had. Pints in hand in the lecture hall. Um, no, that, that's fantastic. I I, I wonder because remember how there was like all the hype about like Vincent Company doing like a business degree at Manchester University or something like that. Like I wonder if people would turn up to like his his matriculation or or his graduation <laughs> or, or things like that. That would be quite funny. To um, be fair, the, the flip side of that is, I guess, like if you ever have a bad game for the national team, you, you, there's no way you can hide. I go to the stream like, that night. National fans will turn up wherever you go to the pub, to like a restaurant, to where you work. And they will call you out no matter what. So, they surely uh... will. Uh, speaking of Denmark, let's look at Denmark for Wales nil first. Um, and this was a, a bit of a bringing back to earth for Wales. Obviously, last time at the Euros, they all got to the semis. They're very excited about making the knockout this time. They sort of a lot of Welsh fans were looking at this game as one of the easier ones in the round, and then it just didn't go that well. And I did think, you know, as good as it is to see Wales go far. I did feel throughout the group stages that Wales really rode their luck through the groups. They played against Switzerland and were very, very lucky to get a point. They played against the Turkey side, who just for whatever reason had decided to forget how to play football. And they got to play against the second string Italian side. And I think that the combination of these sort of three non-challenges really showed. Whereas Denmark, conversely, really had to roll a stone uphill in their in their group. They literally had a player collapse. Um and sort of had to deal not only with the sort of personnel issues that caused, but also the emotional issues that caused, not only in that game, but for the rest of the groups. Yusuf Paulson also wasn't available in this match. So I, I really thought that this was sort of the difference between sort of one team that had, had to be th- going through it all and one team that got not a buy into the knockouts, but an easier ride than maybe they could have had. Um, 
Denmark, conversely, I thought looked really, really good. Casper Dolberg came in, and it was one of those that I looked at that and I thought, oh, Casper Dolberg, God, he used to be fantastic. And now, sort of, he's had a little bit of a sort of a disappointing time. He went over to Nice. He remember you had he had that watch stolen by that player from at Nice, and sort of the player yeah, got kicked and, out. And, and there was a whole weird saga about super, that. Yeah, and it, it never really finished satisfingly, or like no, a nice there was no close. And it, yeah. it, but but it kind of sort of exemplified the time he's had in France. It's sort of been this like weird tumultuous. Like he's never really been able to settle in and put his brand in. And so when I saw that, I was like, Casper mm, Dolberg. Once upon a time, that would have struck fear into the opposition defence, but I don't think it would now. Um, and to his credit, he's now made the case that it should because he looks like the player that people thought he would be a few years ago and, and was fantastic. Mikkel Damsgaard is another player who has just been going from strength to strength. This has really been, this tournament, a advertisement for the quality of Serie A. Obviously, Atalanta are the team that have sort of the most players that have really showed off and been fantastic. But Mikkel Damsgaard plays for um, Sampdoria. He's a fantastic player. He's been absolutely doing the job for Denmark. And is another player that I think will sort of be going to a to a larger club at the end of the summer for a boosted Euros fee. Um, but just fantastic. And I think Denmark will maybe be the team. It's kind of hard to say between them and Czech Republic, but I just feel like the Denmark team is sort of playing almost for like a higher power. We talked about this before, but like everyone else is playing for glory and they're playing for, for Ericsson. They are. I think you put it really well at the beginning, which is that they've been through the flames and out the other side. And they just look like... I mean, can you can you have a more unified dressing room? No, from, no, no, not at all. From the group stage that they had. And, and to recover from that, not just the first game, but also the tough second game that they had. Mm. And to then win their third in the way that they did with this like rousing victory, I, I think they, they frightened me more than almost anyone because of just the power of the narrative, man. The power of the narrative, for sure. It, yeah, absolutely. It, it's taken down better teams than uh, than Wales, that's for sure, so far, and, and it will continue to do so. Um, so I think that they could well be contenders for the title, perhaps. Yeah, it, honestly... Is it a title? It's, it's crazy. It's a, a trophy. Rather than a title, I believe. I, mean, I suppose you have the title of Sorry, European Denmark. champion. <laughs> but, um, Vice champions. <laughs> looking at Italy versus Austria next. This was maybe the first time that we've seen Italy struggle this tournament. I'd be remiss if I sort of slagged off Wales there for having an easy group and didn't say that Italy also had maybe an easier group. I think well, Switzerland... Some might say it was the same group. Well, it, but that's, that's exactly what I mean. It was like <laughs> Switzerland now have sort of knocked out France. And I think some people have sort of, I think Patrick Vieira got sort of retroactively memed for saying like Italy hadn't really had a test. Switzerland hadn't really gone to gear yet at that point. It didn't seem like they sort of stumbled past, uh, you know, way, well, not past, they sort of drawn with Wales. And then they had, um, you, you know, not really had a good show against Italy. They didn't look very good at all in that game. And then they sort of built a bit of confidence by playing against a truly abysmal Turkey side. Um, so this was the first time that we've seen Italy struggle this tournament. It was against a very plucky Austria side that are well organised. They can whip out a surprise. And there was a little point there when Alapsovic scored that goal that got disallowed that we thought Austria were going to be the, the initial upset. Um, but where Italy sort of have that that ability to sort of just come back is the depth. I mean, they brought on players like Federico Chiesa, Matteo Vecina, Manu Locatelli. They just can't be counted out. And obviously those players are the ones that, uh, you know, changed that game. Um, Austria did, of course, score that late goal, which sort of made us think like, oh, you know, this is this is going to bring them back into it. But um, obviously weren't able to get a, a full result out of it. But a very interesting side, I think, you know, maybe this is just my England thing speaking, but like the fact that England managed to play to nil, whereas all the other teams have sort of had a little bit of a struggle, makes me feel positive about any sort of potential meet in the final. Mate, no goals conceded. I mean... Only team to have done it. Well... Yeah, I, again, I would say, I mean, you want to talk about England versus Italy comparisons. Do you think that the decisions to not start someone like Federico Chiesa, who is a really good player, or to not start someone like Locatelli, who has had a really good tournament. Do you think they're justified by the fact that they came on, played well, and they won the game? Or do you think they should have been starting? I, I honestly think both of those decisions make complete sense. I I, I, I like Chiesa a lot, and Locatelli's been fantastic. I would actually slightly start a different... I would probably have Locatelli and Verratti alongside either Jorginho or Varela and drop one of those two. But I can understand why Locatelli gets dropped for Verratti, because Verratti had a fantastic game here. He is one of the best midfielders in the world. I can get why he goes. And similarly, Chiesa... As fantastic as he is, he'd be taking the place of Berardi, who has had a fantastic tournament as well. So I think this is sort of two sides of the same argument. Italy have loads of depth, but that also means they can't start every player. Um, 
So yeah, I, I didn't have a huge issue with how they lined up. The only issue I would have had maybe was with how long it took to make a lot of the subs. Um, I think um, Mancini sort of waited a long time and almost arguably waited too long when, when Arnautovic scored that disallowed goal. Um, but luckily, they managed to get away with it. Yeah, I, I would dis- I would agree that the difference is that the players that are ahead of, of those um, those Italians are just having good tournaments. It's, it's hard to leave them out, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Looking at Belgium-Portugal, um, this was one of those games where I have a very funny relationship with XG because I think that XG is useful in the right way. But there are some people who simp for XG so hard that games like this sort of like maybe very happy when there's one team that has like very minimal XG. It's the only important team has statistic like, camp. But this is the th- some people do it. Some people go like, oh yeah, like we lost three 0 but like our XG was like seven and their XG was two, and it's like yeah, but you lost three 0 <laughs> So it's like the quality, like a lot of it. Or like um, what was the other one? There was a game where the deciding it wasn't even Germany France, but there was a game at half time. The only goal had been an own goal, and one team's XG was literally zero, and they were winning one 0 and it was like. So that is a case in point of the stat being useful to a degree, but not sort of what you should what you should ride on. Um, but the game itself, Belgium one 0 Portugal. Ruben Diaz, along with Harry Kane, actually, we were sort of talking about debating which one of them should be the PFL Player of the Year in the Premier League. Undoubtedly, the two best players in the league this season. Both of them shocking tournaments so far. Ruben Diaz has bizarrely been the weak point in that Portugal defence. Um, aside from perhaps the right back, which we'll get into in a second, but Pepe has been way more reliable. Guerrero has been way more reliable as well. Um, and it's an interesting, you know, thing to see how Portugal have fallen down there. Looking at the right back side, Joao Cancelo got admitted for the squad for testing positive for COVID. And I look at that and I wonder if that was a huge mistake because he tested positive for COVID just before the tournament. And so they decided to leave him home. There were a few other players that that happened to. Dejan Kulisevsky tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, had a, had integral, a yeah. In their final group game, he came on in the 65th minute, got two assists. Sergio Busquets tested positive for coronavirus just before the tournament. Mm-hmm. He missed the first two group games and came in for the last group game. And, and bossed the midfield. And well, and as part of his stability, Spain went from being a side that was spluttering and stuttering to scoring 10 goals in two games. And that's obviously not all Sergio Busquets, but a big part of the reason why the midfield players like Pedri have been more free is because you've got an, a veteran player in that position to hold things down. And I just wondered, looking at... Obviously, first and foremost, that game against Germany when they got absolutely run ragged by uh, Robin Gersens and they targeted Nelson Semedo. And again here, when a lot of stuff was coming down the right, Diogo Dallo got run for his money because he was sort of the backup there for, for Nelson Semedo. You know, was that a huge mistake, omitting Joao Cancelo? Or could you have just gone, right, you're not going to play the first two games, but come back in? Because he was one of the best right backs in the world this season. He was, but again, and, and I guess the only thing that you could argue is that Next to someone like Ruben Diaz, and they play together at club level, would that have been really good because they know this each other's play very well, or would it have been would he have been as bad as Diaz because they're trying to play in a different system than what they're used to, and they both would have looked equally out of depth? I think you got to look at maybe the fact that there's more than just the coronavirus as to why they didn't make it. They might have been kind of. Like the manager might have been thinking to himself, like, I know you're not going to suit my style of play because of how you play at club level. And obviously I would include you, but just because of this, I feel like you're going to miss these I'm games. Gonna, I'm not going to move everything I don't feel confident me. in you because you're used to different play. So I'm going to leave you at home and I'm going to rely on other players. I don't think the inclusion of Joao Cancelo would have won them this game. I mean, it, it, it may not have. It might have also won them the game against Germany, so they would have even played this game. They'd have been playing against us. That's a fair point. And, and, and could have maybe... So I, I don't know. It just, it just seemed to me like it was a it was a, an omission that was maybe... They were almost too keen to drop him. And I know we had criticism about sort of like dropping... Right. Like, for example, Harry Maguire. Like, oh, do you drop like Tyrone Mings to play Harry Maguire? Who, incidentally, was immense against Germany. But uh, in my opinion, anyway. But, um, but in this scenario, Portugal have had... Nelson Semedo do really poorly, then Diogo Dalot come in and do really poorly, and it's like you have a very good right back who is presently fit on the and available, and because you missed him yeah. from the squad, he can't play for you. It just seemed like a bit of an oversight. Belgium, on the other hand, um, did just enough in this game, but are in a little bit of a tricky spot. They play against Italy in the next round, but go into the quarterfinals without both Eden Hazard and Kevin De Bruyne, and 
it just feels like one of those things that both of those players <laughs> are just so amazing, but just have like knees and, and hamstrings and ankles and everything just made of papier mache. And it's one of those where even if they come back for the semi finals, you wouldn't be surprised if they made it, came out for the semi finals, bossed that game, and then got injured for the final. True. Yeah. I mean, wrap, wrap them in bubble wrap, Roberto Martinez. Oh, you've really got to take care of them, don't you? I mean, I guess the only thing is they didn't have the best game this game before they got injured. I mean, and Hazard wasn't even the best Hazard on the pitch, um, as he himself has admitted. Um, you know, Dorgan had a great game and scored an incredible goal. Uh, I do just think Belgium have such good depth and. I would be more worried about them not having someone like Axel Witzel than I am about them not having Eden Hazard. I agree, but I don't think that's true with Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne, I would say, is maybe the difference between them winning a final and losing a final. But I think that against Italy, who struggled so much against Austria, have lost any sort of momentum that they would have had in the group stages through to the knockouts. I think that they might be able to have enough. They, I think they can have enough in the tank to beat Italy still, but obviously it'd be a lot easier if they had him. It's a, it's a tough one for them. It's definitely a tough one for them. I mean, the fact that they won this, you know, one nil suggests that they are in that top level, but they can still struggle. And I just feel like we've just talked about how Italy have so many top players that they're keeping other top players out. And while Belgium do have a lot of depth, a lot of these players are coming in, like Utrees Mertens, for example because the Kevin De Bruyne's are injured and, and, and not able to do it. True, but I mean, still playing decently. I mean, Drew's Mertens, I definitely feel like, has a lot more to offer than what we've seen, as does, you know, someone like, um, who am I trying to think of? Um, Yannick Carrasco as well. Another great player yeah. who had an amazing season and uh, has just been left on the bench all, all tournaments. So I I kind of think that, yeah, they it's they're playing on a hard mode. <laughs> Without without Kevin, but um, they 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 can still do it. Easy mode play with both, Hot, like yeah, exactly. normal mode play without one, hard mode play without both. Um, our last game to wrap up this episode is Sweden one, Ukraine two. Um, a pretty even game, broken up by moments of individual quality, as I think we all suspected this game would be. Both, particularly Sweden, have been like a very well put together side. My sort of prediction about this game looking at it was sort of going like Sweden are the better team but Ukraine have more star quality um, and Ukraine are quite interesting because I haven't really been able to put my finger on exactly how they want to play this tournament they've played all sorts of different systems they scored all sorts of different goals set up differently in various games and it's kind of hard because I've been thinking about them a lot as England's opposition what do they want to play against us part of that conversation is going to be that they have lots of injuries going into the quarterfinals too so I'm sure it's going to be a slightly different different system but they played a back five in this game uh, or back three back five um, and you know Zinchenko who's been playing sort of the left side of a midfield three played as a left wing back um, Zinchenko incidentally is uh, he scored in this game he's the fifth Man City player to score at the Euros only one other team he also got the assist for the second uh, he did. He did get this as well. Zinchenko is the fifth Man City player to score at the Euros, though. Uh, only one other team have as many players to have scored at the Euros. Could you uh, care to guess which that team is? Whoa! Only one other team. Man City have five players that have scored at this tournament. One other team also has five, and no one has six. Okay, it's not. I don't think it's anyone in England. Kai Havertz. Andreas Christensen. I think that's it for Chelsea. Believe Man so. United, like famously, have have had only one scorer so far, and it's Paul Pogba. Um, yeah, well, Ronaldo takes penalties for Portugal, so that kind of. That's true. Juventus, maybe. I it's, don't think it's it's. Not, you're, you're I, don't, warm. I don't think it's Real Madrid. You're warm with Juventus. I'll say that much. Is it Inter Milan? Warmer. Well, actually, colder in terms colder. of the position. Um, so it's... Oh, is it something like it's on Roma? Um, Come on. There's a team that's had loads of standout stars this tournament. That I would argue is the team that, despite being a club team, has won the Euros because all of these players have suddenly added a zero to their, their transfer fee. Atla- no. Uh, I'm having a mental block. No. It, it is it's Atlanta. Atlanta. It's it is Atlanta. Uh, Man City have had Raheem Sterling, Kevin De Bruyne, Aymeric Laporte, Alexander Zinchenko and Ferran Torres. Whereas Atalanta have had Joachim Mahler, Robin Gosens, uh, Ruslan Malinovsky, Matteo Pessina, and Alexi Miranchuk all score yeah, goals. Pessina's, yeah. yeah. 
So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Atlanta, the true winners of the Euros, <laughs> even before the, the tournament has finished, because all of their players have suddenly gone way up in value. Ironically, you always hope that they, I mean, you just hope they don't sell them all, right? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you, you hope not all of them, but I mean, a few of them are definitely going to be moving on, and at least now they're going to be well remunerated. True. I guess just always harder to, uh, you know, buy someone back. You just wonder if they're going to be, you know, a Spurs or a, um, a Brentford. Definitely true. Um, Rupert, I think that about does us for this episode. We will have four special preview episodes, short little 15-minute clips uh, previewing the quarterfinals to come. Um, so look forward to those, um, and we hope you enjoy them as much as you enjoyed the special episode ahead of England versus Germany. Rupert, great to talk to you as always. Cam, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone at home. Keep watching the football. It's getting better. I feel like it's getting better. It does feel like it's getting, and, and it'll be best when it when we win the Euros. What's going to happen next next week? I don't know. I mean, a ten ten games basically. <laughs> um, well, all that and more soon to come. And um, till then, we'll see you next time. Cheers, guys. Bye. Armchair Analyst was recorded remotely by Cameron MacDonald and Rupert Meadows. The album artwork was provided by our good friend Amshill.